good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for today's KVA. Today, we're going to be talking about mixing tanks using ANSYS CFD. Um, for today's agenda, we're going to start with some of the common industrial challenges in the process industry. Um, you know, whether you're working with bioreactors or just stirred tank reactors or just, um, you know, the chemical industry, pharmaceutical industry, there are some common challenges in designing and optimizing this equipment. Uh, so we're going to talk about, um, you know, the different ways in which you can leverage CFD. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about the physics in agitated vessels, how we can classify them, uh, depending on this classification. Uh, the complexity of your CFD problem may range from very simple to very complex, uh, so it's good to have some general idea about it. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about the simulation capabilities, uh, not just in terms of setting up the physics, but also in terms of gaining efficiency uh, while uh, doing these problems using ANSYS CFD products, and then we'll do a short demonstration for a single phase uh, mixing tank problem. Uh, I see a question in the Q&A session uh, about Autodesk. Um, uh, as far as I know, no, the Autodesk um, CFD program is still there. Uh, we'll be happy to chat with you if you have questions about, um, you know, the different Autodesk and answer CFD capabilities. Uh, like Christina mentioned, you can always reach out to us at support at kativ.com. We'll be happy to answer those questions. Um, if you have Q&A about the technical presentation itself, uh, feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A box. I'll get to them towards the end of the webinar. Okay, so with that said, let's go ahead and get started. Now, some of the most commonly encountered challenges while designing and optimizing mixing equipment is usually scale up. Um, Engineers usually work in a laboratory to test uh, mixing equipment. You know, it may range from two liters, five liters, 20 liters, but the actual manufacturing equipment, you know, uh, may be much larger in scale. It may go up to, you know, thousands of liters. So apart from maintaining geometric similarity, how do you ensure that you're getting the same performance, same quality of mixing uh, and not missing any physics when you scale up or scale down? Um, so that is one area where in, instead of doing uh, very expensive testing or, you know, using empirical relations, you can leverage CFD to get more uh, reliable results. Uh, the other thing that um, people in this industry are always looking for is increasing the yield, uh, making sure that the quality of the final product is up to the mark. Uh, not over designing the equipment, you know, not, you know, um, spending a lot of time and money in having equipment that um, is probably an overkill, uh, because the materials can be quite expensive, um, especially in terms of the quality of the chemicals itself for the pharmaceutical company. Uh, APIs are quite expensive, as you guys must know. Uh, we also want to make sure that the power consumption is optimized. Um, that, you know, the mixing equipment um, is well integrated with the overall system. So all these challenges can be solved using um, CFD and simulation. And uh, hopefully through this presentation, I'll be able to tell you guys how. So if we're talking about the physics, right, in uh, mixing tanks or just agitated vessels in general, uh, they can range from very simple single phase flows to highly complex reacting flows. Uh, if you're doing a single phase simulation, you can definitely visualize the flow characteristics. You'll be able to look at the velocities, the turbulence, uh, the shear rate, and that's going to give you a good idea of, you know, okay, where is the mixing happening? You know, what are the dead zones? Do I need to tweak the design a little bit um, to, you know, get more homogeneous mixtures? Uh, or, you know, what is the blend time, uh, stuff like that. Um, if you're doing gas liquid flows, then you're probably looking at uh, quantities like gas holdup. You know, you may be looking at bubble size distribution. Um, if you're doing free surface flows, you might be interested in predicting the vortex, uh, ensuring that there's no air entrainment. Um, if you're doing liquid solid flows, then again, you can look at the solid suspension itself, uh, whether you're mixing powders into a fluid, you may look at the cloud height, uh, you may look at the solubility. Um, so that is a different type of application. 
And then if you're doing reacting flows, then again, you're looking at mass transfer coefficients. It could be for a crystallization application. And you know that would uh, depend on a lot of factors, especially the interfacial uh, area between the different phases. Now, going from single phase to reacting flows, your complexity increases. So you will need to add more physics to your simulation setup. And um, all this can be done using ANSYS CFD tools. Uh, for today's presentation, I'll primarily talk about Fluent, um, but there are other CFD solvers. CFX also can handle rotating machinery pretty well. Um, so there's a lot of overlap between the physics and capabilities uh, if you have a preference for one solver over the other. Now, we saw the classification of different types of mixing problems from a physics point of view. Um, from an application standpoint, these could be just single phase mixing systems. Uh, for the gas liquid type of classification, we usually see that in bioreactors when you have a sparger and you, know, you are constantly monitoring the gas velocity to ensure that uh, there's optimum mixing. Um, you know, Solid dissolution, again, uh, for crystallization, uh, powder mixing, that type of problem. And then you may have different type of mixers itself. You may have intermeshing mixers wherein you have two different types of impellers. Uh, you may also have static mixers wherein you don't really have any moving components. It's just that the static geometry is arranged in a way that promotes mixing. And then apart from the physics itself, you may also be interested in making this process more efficient, right? Uh, democratize this process so that you don't necessarily need a CFD expert to set up the problem every time. But if you have a good baseline setup, then you want to make it reusable for everybody uh, in the team so that they can just plug in the values and get quick uh, what of evaluations. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about all these uh, different buckets. Now, let's start with the single phase mixing systems. Um, you know, although it is simple to set up, uh, there's so much data and information that you can derive from these problems. The first thing that, you know, you may want to use single phase mixing systems for is for scale up and scale down. Uh, we get a lot of requests from our customers, prospects, you know, who want to design a better mixing tank, uh, you know, who want to ensure that, okay, given this impeller, uh, I'm getting the desired, uh, you know, concentration. I want to look at the blend time. I want to look at the residence time. Um, you know, I want to see the shear rate. How do I do that? Uh, the advantage of CFD is that you now have data at every point in the fluid domain, right? Um, and you don't necessarily need to restrict yourself to Newtonian fluids. Even if your fluid, you know, follows, say, for example, the power law, uh, you should be able to, you know, um, simulate that pretty easily inside ANSYS Fluent. Um, so, you know, on the screen here, you look at four different cases where a tank has been, you know, scaled up from 20 liter to 20,000 liter. Uh, there's geometric similarity, of course, but uh, depending on the criteria of scale up, say, for example, you're looking at, uh, you know, the energy dissipation rate, uh, or, you know, you're looking at, uh, say, for example, power per unit volume, uh, whatever your criteria might be, you want to make sure that at the scaled up level, you are predicting the right operating conditions to get the same performance. So those type of simulations can be well handled uh, even if you're doing a simple single phase mixing system. So here are some of the commonly exported results from such analysis, right? You can look at the shear rate, the power number, blend time, uh, flow number, uh, Kolmogorov scales, uh, whatever you need to ensure that, okay, my mixing is optimum. Um, you may at, you know, just visually at a glance and detect dead areas or see if say, for example, um, you know, you have um, regions where your shear rate is too high or too low. And, you know, it can be both a good thing, right? Uh, in the case of shear rate, since we're just talking about single phase flows, probably, you know, having a high shear rate uh, will, you know, get you more emulsified flows. Um, but if you're looking at bioreactors where you have different components, different phases, perhaps, you know, the components get damaged if they're subjected to a high shear rate for a very long time. 
Um, so, you know, this is an important quantity that is often monitored for mixing tank simulations. You can also look at the zonal residence time distribution, right? Um, you can uh, see in which particular region uh, you have more stagnation or, you know, you have, uh, uh, you know, more residence time for the uh, fluids that are being mixed. So these are some commonly exported contour results from ANSYS Fluent itself. You don't even need to go uh, to a post-processing tool. Uh, and this is good enough to at least qualitative tell you how the flow is behaving. And then of course you can go in and export more numerical results like the moment coefficients or you know the turbulent dissipation rate, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we talked about the single phase analysis. Let's talk a little bit about gas liquid systems. Most important quantity, of course, is gas holdup. It affects so many things, right? So many um, uh, factors that can you know, play a role in determining your overall um, physics in the flow domain. See, gas holdup will determine you know, what is the size of your bubble distribution. And then depending on the size of the bubbles, your interfacial area itself may change. If your interfacial area is changing, your mass transfer may change. Uh, the speed of the bubbles may change. Your residence time will change. Uh, so there are so many things that depend on this uh, particular quantity. And then you may also want to do a simulation where you're just looking at a free surface flow. You have air on the top, you have you know, fluid at the bottom, liquid at the bottom, and maybe there aren't any baffles in your domain. Uh, and because of tangential velocities, you have a vortex formation, which can be bad because you know, you're entraining a lot of air in your system. Uh, so those type of simulations, again, can be done with the help of gas liquid uh, simulation setup. Um, again, the mass transfer rate coefficients, those are very important quantities. Uh, you can definitely export that using CFD simulation, along with all the results that you were already getting from a single phase uh, CFD simulation. So these are some of the post-processing results that you can get from a gas liquid uh, sort of a mixing tank problem. Here you can look at the uh, gas distribution. Uh, you know, if you have some bypass of the baffles, um, you know, uh, some short circuiting at the baffles, then you'd be easily able to uh, visualize that. If you have air entrainment in your domain, you'd be able to visualize that. Um, here you can see that they've created an ISO surface of gas volume fraction of 10%. And then on that ISO surface, they've plotted the bubble size distribution. So this gives you a very good idea of uh, what is the size of the bubbles in a particular region um, and you know uh, what the entire flow domain looks like on a relative scale. Um, here, instead of using an ISO surface, they've just used planes and then plotted the bubble size distribution on those planes. Um, so this way you can tell whether, uh, you know, your sparger gas flow velocity needs to be altered or perhaps the impeller speed needs to be changed. Uh, gives you a very good idea about what tweaks you need to make to your overall tank design. Now, let's talk a little bit about solid liquid systems. Um, again, we are uh, slowly increasing in complexity, but the good thing is that with uh, ANSYS CFD, uh, you get reliable solutions, uh, well-validated solutions. And in terms of solid liquid systems, what you'd usually be looking at is you know, solid suspension, cloud height prediction, making sure that the solid is not accumulating in one place, uh, you know, that it, it's evenly distributed. Uh, you may wanna look at dissolution systems, right? Which again, depends on so many factors, solubility, you know, it'll depend on the interfacial area again, um, the concentration at that particular location. Um, so these type of physics can be incorporated into your ANSYS fluent CFD simulation. If you're doing crystallization, that again is possible. Uh, again, um, as far as the flow wheel visualization is concerned, here you can see uh, how the cloud height has been predicted uh, in this type of a simulation. Um, same thing over here, as we keep increasing the impeller speed from 100 to 220 RPM, you can see that the accumulation of solid particles is no longer restricted to one area. And now, you know, it's more evenly divided, uh, distributed in the domain. Uh, here you see another volume fraction rendering. Uh, 
uh, with turbulence dispersion force and without turbulence dispersion force. Uh, in terms of CFD, you could just consider this as you know turbulence dissipation rate. And you can see the difference between these two uh, results. These are generic results, um, not really referring to a case, but just want to give you an idea of what sort of values you can derive uh, from your CFD simulation. And then, like I said earlier, you may have inter um, meshing mixes, right? You know, you may have a case wherein you have um, different types of impellers just to uh, promote the mixing in your domain. And this type of simulation may need you do, uh, to simulate complex motion. Uh, it may also be used for fluids that are not Newtonian. So whatever results we've talked about so far, all that can be derived from this simulation as well. Uh, and the good thing about having these capabilities is that you can um, optimize your design as much as possible, uh, evaluate several what if scenarios and see you know, what uh, gives you the best performance uh, within reasonable time and cost. And then you may also have static mixes, right? You don't really have any moving components. You just have a complex geometry. You may have different geometric parameters in that geometry that you want to vary and then perhaps build a response surface uh, you know, in the design exploration space and see, okay, which type of geometry gives you uh, the maximum perturbation in your fluid domain, right? Again, uh, you can look at local temperature variation, you can look at pressure drop variation, you can see how the static mixer sort of integrates into your overall system. If there are you know, some system installation requirements that you need to maintain or meet, uh, then those gut checks can be performed using CFT. And then lastly, before we move on to the demonstration part, uh, I do wanna talk about democratization and system level modeling. Um, see the idea of doing um, a full scale um, simulation of your mixing tank, or perhaps doing one of the scales and then using those baseline results to scale up or scale down uh, is to make sure that you've set up your problem correctly perhaps validate your simulation results with some experimental or test data. And then once you have confidence in that one simulation that you've run, uh, the idea is to reuse, repurpose that same simulation uh, to evaluate further what if scenarios, uh, to optimize your design further, uh, to you know, make changes uh, and see if that gives you better performance. And you can do that in a couple of ways. Um, now. This slide primarily talks about extracting reduced order models from ANSYS fluent simulations. A lot of you may be already familiar with it. What you basically do is, you know, you already have a data space, uh, sorry, you already have the data. And then that allows you to build a design space uh, that can be reused uh, without doing a full scale 3D simulation. So if you have your reduced order model already exported from Fluent, uh, you can take out the CFD aspect from it and then allow more people in your team, even if they're not CFD experts, to use that reduced order model and uh, get some quick decisions uh, on, you know, if I change this, then what happens to my overall flow performance? The other thing that ANSYS provides is a mixing wizard. It is an ACT extension inside ANSYS Workbench. And it's basically a template that um, helps anybody, even if they're not experts in CFD, uh, you know, build a mixing tank from scratch. You can include different components. You can customize it as much as possible. Uh, you know, it uses ANSYS tools in the background, like Design Modeler, ANSYS Workbench Meshing, and the ANSYS Fluent Solver. Uh, to give you a step-by-step -step guideline on, okay, these are the components that I want to add. This is the speed at which I want it to run. This is the physics I want to add. Now you do the simulation and give me the results and it'll give you the results in CFD post um, that are usually uh, evaluated for these type of simulations. So all that setup is already done. Uh, it's very easy for somebody, you know, who's new to CFD to pick that up and 
use it for uh, doing their mixing tank problems. Once you have you know, a mixing tank problem from the mixing wizard, you can again then proceed to extract a ROM out of it. And that way is, uh, you're not repeating you know, full 3D simulations for each and every design iteration that you run. Now, um, some of you might be familiar with digital twins. Uh, reduced order models can also be used to build digital twins that can, you know, integrate a lot of your system parameters. And, you know, it'll almost be like, you know, creating an IoT platform for monitoring your overall system. So if you're doing something really complex that requires a lot of computational resources, um, and, you know, it makes sense for you to reuse a template um, and baseline data space, then, uh, yeah, that would be the most efficient way of doing this type of a problem. So now that I've, you know, covered all the theoretical context uh, before going to the demonstration, um, we are going to do a simple single phase um, mixing tank problem from scratch. We're not going to use the mixing wizard just so that, you know, you guys can see the process and ask questions. But if you are curious about the mixing wizard or ROM capabilities, feel free to reach out to us. We'll be happy to provide you with some white papers or more resources. All right, so let me go ahead and share my workbench screen. So what I have open in front of me is a simple workbench project. I already have the simulation done, but uh, we'll go over the geometry once and then we'll mesh it and then set it up. And then perhaps we don't run it, we'll use the already solved solution to uh, look at post-processing. So just give it a minute. Okay, so this is a simple mixing tank problem. Uh, this was built from scratch. This is, you know, uh, not from an imported CAD geometry, but if you had the impeller geometry uh, from your supplier, or, you know, if you created it in some native CAD platform, you can, of course, go ahead and import that. Um, this was all done in space claim from scratch. So what you see is the fluid domain of the mixing tank. Um, and you'll notice that there are certain regions that have been subtracted, uh, which basically show the baffles, right? So these were the baffles that were initially solid bodies and then subtracted from the overall fluid domain because we just need the walls and nothing is actually happening inside the solid thickness itself. And then we also have the impellers, two impellers in this mixing tank. Uh, again, we are just working with the walls. The actual solid geometry does not need to be included. We're not doing any heat transfer, uh, just flow problems, right? And then um, what you'll see is that the top of the tank has been marked as a symmetry boundary condition. That's because you know it's gonna be a no slip wall. Uh, sorry, it's gonna be a slip wall. Um, we are not really uh, considering any fluxes through this symmetry boundary condition. Um, so we've just assigned it um, as symmetry. And then you have the tank bottom over here, which is a standard wall, no slip wall. And this is the wall of the tank itself. And then you will see two cylindrical regions marked in pink um, around the impellers. Uh, which are going to be the moving reference frame zone. Uh, now, I think I've talked about moving reference frame in one of our uh, earlier KVAs, but for those of you who are unfamiliar with the term, uh, these are basically zones where you assign relative velocities uh, to the fluid zone instead of actually imparting mesh motion to show that the solid body is moving. If I were to simulate this problem as it is, then my impeller is actually moving. That means the adjacent mesh should also be moving. It becomes a transient problem. Uh, it's not very difficult to set up. You can do that using a sliding mesh formulation, but just for the sake of simplicity, uh, we're gonna assume a steady state problem. 
and we are going to use relative velocities in these cylindrical zones uh, instead of um, you know imparting an absolute moving velocity to the blades themselves. Okay, and you'll also notice that the volumes, the three volumes, the tank volume and the two moving reference volumes, they have all been shared, right? We have done shared topology because we want a conformal mesh at all these interfaces. And whenever we do shared topology, uh, the shared edges, they show up in blue. So that sort of tells you that this is ready for the next step of meshing. Um, whatever we did not need, say, for example, the original backfill geometries, right, the solid bodies that are not participating in the CFD simulation, we've suppressed it. Um, suppressing it in space claim means that it's not going to go forward uh, to the meshing stage. And then, like we already saw, we've assigned the name selections so that the boundary conditions can be applied easily. All right. So, um, let me go ahead and close this guy. And I'll start another project over here. And let's go ahead and mesh this inside Fluent Meshing. So I'm using eight cores on my machine. I have 16 on this computer, but uh, feel free to use as many as you have available on your particular machine. Um, fluent meshing is able to, you know, distribute the meshing processes over different cores. Uh, it does not consume the HPC license, so feel free to leverage it as you deem fit. Now, because we created the space claim geometry from scratch, I already know that it is watertight, uh, nothing needed to be cleaned. Uh, we already did the Boolean operations, shared topology, so we can go ahead and use the watertight geometry workflow inside fluent meshing. I'm just going to go ahead and import the geometry. And since the geometry is already connected in the workbench project schematic, the file path is populated automatically. This takes a few seconds. And fluent meshing is just one way of meshing this. You can also go ahead and use workbench meshing if you wanted to generate a mesh. But uh, for mixing tank problems, uh, you know, it helps to have a good quality mesh. Um, so I, I'm going to eventually generate a hex core mesh so that the bulk of the domain has hexahedral cells. So this I find to be one of the easiest ways of doing so. Uh, so that's why I'm using fluent meshing. Um, now, if I want to add local sizing, I can definitely go ahead and do that. A lot of the mixing tank tutorials, if you find online, they'll show that you can have a body of influence in your domain, which helps you refine the mesh in certain regions. Um, I'm not going to go ahead and add uh, local sizing today in the interest of saving time. Uh, but if you wanted to go ahead and do that, feel free to do so. So we're just gonna go ahead with the global sizing. And then once you um, come to the surface meshing stage, it'll show you the boxes, the size boxes. Uh, that'll tell you what are the minimum uh, sizes in your domain. So, and this one is for the maximum size. So I think that the minimum size is a little too small, little too fine. Um, ideally, you know, across your impeller thickness, you may want to have one or two cells, um, but for saving time, I'm just going to go ahead and increase the minimum size. We'll go ahead and do 0 0.001. And then once you increase the size in the field, the size boxes preview automatically increases to give you an estimate of what that would look like. And similarly, the maximum size looks a bit large for me. So we'll just go ahead and change that to 0 0.01. Uh, the curvature angle is fine. Uh, we'll keep it at 18. Uh, again, you may wanna change it to 12, which basically means that you'll have cells at 12 degree intervals around a curved surface, but 
but uh, for saving time, let's go with 18. Uh, you can also scope proximity to both faces and edges so that you maintain, say, for example, two cells per gap between all faces, not just edges, but that takes a little bit more time, will increase the cell count. So let's just go with the default selection for the rest of the fields. And I'll go ahead and generate the surface mesh. The initial mesh that is generated is, you know, composed of triangles, right? But eventually when you generate the volume mesh, you can change that to polyhedral uh, or stick with tetrahedral if that's what you prefer. So here I have inserted a clipping plane that lets me uh, see the midsection. So for the most part, it looks good. It looks okay, uh, in my opinion. So we can go with this sizing. And then once the surface mesh is generated, it will also tell you the skewness uh, quality. And if there are cells, sorry, if there are faces that are greater than 0.7 or 0.8, it'll show you a warding and you can go ahead and improve the surface mesh accordingly. So in this particular domain, um, like I have been saying, we don't really need the solid bodies. We only need the fluid bodies. And so we subtracted all the solid bodies. So when we're describing the geometry, we can just say the geometry consists of fluid regions with no voids. Uh, do we want to change all the fluid, fluid boundary types from wall to internal? Yes. Because remember, the moving reference frame is also a fluid zone, and it's definitely talking to the stationary zone outside. So this moving reference frame wall uh, is not actually a wall. It's an internal surface through which fluid can pass. Um, we've already done shared topology in space claim, so we don't need to do it again here in Fluent. And then in the newer versions of Fluent meshing, you have something called multi-zone meshing, people who've been using workbench meshing might be familiar with it. We're not doing any multi-zone meshing today. So we'll just go ahead and do describe geometry. Now fluent meshing is quite smart because we mentioned in space claim itself that this particular face over here is going to be symmetry. Uh, it automatically picks it up as a symmetry boundary type. The rest of them have um, wall appended in their name. So again, it automatically knows that these are walls. So we're just gonna go ahead and update the boundaries. And then all the three regions, all the three volumes in our domain um, are filled with fluid, uh, whether it be the tank geometry or the moving reference frame zones. So I'll go ahead and do update regions. And then um, normally I would add boundary layers, you know, especially if you're anticipating high shear uh, or if you're working with, you know, various rheological uh, fluids uh, that may deteriorate in terms of viscosity under high shear. Uh, so in those regions, definitely add boundary layers. But for this problem, uh, I'm not, you know, anticipating any such physics. Plus, we're trying to save a little bit of time. So I'm just going to go ahead and say no to boundary layers. And then we're gonna finally generate the volume mesh. Like I said, I wanna go for a hex core mesh. So I'll go with poly hex core and then generate the volume mesh. Earlier when used, we used to use ANSYS workbench meshing for this type of a problem, uh, we could also you know, just have a tetrahedral mesh and then convert it to polyhedral inside the fluent solver itself. Now with the help of fluent meshing, you can just straight away generate a polyhedral mesh. And uh, that reduces your cell count a lot compared to having a tetrahedral cell uh, type element everywhere in your domain. Okay, so since the insert clipping planes is on, you can see the type of mesh that was generated. Let's see. So hopefully it's a little bit more bright. So you can see in most of the domain, these are hexahedral cells. And as we uh, get closer to the walls, then it becomes a polyhedral mesh, but the mesh quality uh, looks pretty good uh, for the rest of the regions. Okay. So now that we have a check mark against all these 
uh, items in the workflow, we are good to move to the solver stage. So we're going to go ahead and do switch to solution. And so it's automatically going to import this mesh into the solver. Okay, so now we are in the solution mode of Fluent. And um, the first thing that I do after importing my mesh is always check the geometry, see if everything got imported correctly. Let me go ahead and turn on the edges. Let me go ahead and turn on the walls. So this will tell you um, how the tank got imported. Looks about right. And then you can go ahead and check the mesh really quickly to see everything looks good. You could also report the quality. I'm not going to do that. We already did that part in fluent meshing. I am going to change the units for angular velocity from radians per second to RPM. And then um, if we were doing, say, for example, a sliding mesh formulation instead of a moving reference frame formulation, uh, you would want to turn on transient. Uh, but since we're doing moving reference frame, let's just stick with steady. And then um, you may or may not want to turn on gravity depending on the physics in your particular problem. Um, it doesn't hurt. It's just, you know, your body forces will include gravity now that you've turned it on in your equations. But uh, if you have more buoyant flow or if you have, uh, you know, uh, particle flow in your domain, definitely gravity plays a huge role. So in this particular case, gravity is acting in the minus Z direction. So I'm going to go ahead and do minus 9.81. And um, under models, um, we don't really have to turn on energy because we're not looking at any thermal properties. Uh, for turbulence, I'm gonna stick with the standard default SSTK Omega. You may want to change the tur turbulence model depending on the uh, level of complexity you're experiencing, or if you have a lot of different scales uh, that might prompt a different choice. Uh, of uh, turbulence model. But for this case, let's just stick with the default SSDK Omega. And then under materials, let me go ahead and quickly choose a liquid. So we'll go to the Fluent database, choose water liquid. And so now this water is going to be the fluid in our tanks. Um, so we had three fluid zones in our meshing stage inside space claim. Those got imported inside Fluent Solver as well. Uh, you can always right click and see the zones, right? So these are the two MRF zones and the rest is the tank body. So let us go into the MRF zone. Now, first of all, this is gonna be filled with water. So make sure you select the right material from the drop-down menu. Um, and here you can assign it frame motion. Uh, so again, frame motion is just a way of assigning relative velocities to the fluid zone instead of assigning a velocity to the actual solid impeller wall, okay? Uh, and this allows you to render the actually transient problem quasi-steady. So you're looking at average quantities at a given snapshot, all right? So um, we built the geometry in space claim from scratch. So we already made sure that it was oriented with the axis of rotation, which is you know along the Z axis. I'm just going to go ahead and um, specify the RPM as 300. Uh, rest, we don't need to do anything. We'll just go ahead and apply this. And then we'll copy this boundary condition to the second moving reference frame zone as well. So it got automatically copied, all right? And then for the tank simulation, uh, for the tank zone, because it is stationary, let us just fill it with water, but we don't need to assign any frame motion or mesh motion to it, okay? 
Now, in case, you know, somebody was wondering, hey, you know, you're showing me moving reference frame formulation. What if I wanted to do a sliding mesh? What if I wanted the impellers to actually rotate and then the zone, the cylindrical zone can basically slide uh, relative to the stationary zone that would mimic the problem uh, pretty accurately, right? So all you would do is you would go to the zone uh, where you want to assign sliding mesh motion. And then instead of selecting frame motion, you just select mesh motion, or you can also click on copy to mesh motion and that'll automatically make your MRF problem a sliding mesh problem, okay? Uh, if you turn this on, it'll also turn on the transient solver uh, from what I understand, because it's going to have time steps and you're actually gonna be moving the mesh, okay? All right, so we've done the cell zone conditions. Now, um, don't need to do anything with interiors, don't need to do anything with symmetry. Again, uh, it's just a way of making sure that there are no fluxes through that particular wall. There's no normal components or gradient of the variables. And the last remaining thing is looking at the velocity of the wall itself. So say for example, we turn on these guys, right? So everything that you see in the graphics window is actually rotating, right, in real life. And um, this blue impeller and this green portion, this blue impeller and the portion of that, the small portion over here, um, those are inside the moving reference frame zone. So they are accounted for. But what about the rest of the shaft here, you know, the, the surface that you see in red? In reality, that is moving as well. So if it is moving with a certain velocity, the fluid cell adjacent to it, because, you know, it has a no slip boundary condition, should have that same velocity uh, at the wall, correct? So we need to make sure that we are assigning the right velocity to this shaft body as well. So let's just look at the... Uh, boundary condition name, you click on it, this shows up, and then you can click on more to open the full panel. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna assign it as a moving wall. We're gonna make it rotational. Again, the axis of rotation is about Z axis. So this is automatically selected. We are going to assign 300 RPM here as well. And so now everything, in this particular domain is moving at that same RPM speed, all right? So this is all that you need to do in terms of uh, setting up the problem. You can go ahead and set up some report definitions really quickly. Uh, one thing to always check is the moment or the torque in these problems. So you can go ahead and select everything that's actually rotating. And then again, this is already about Z axis. And go ahead and you know print to console and then hit OK. So that report definition will act as another monitor in your simulation. And you could also look at some averaged quantity in your entire problem to ensure that your solution is converging. So you could look at uh, volume average of say pressure or velocity, or in this case, turbulence. I would say that is also a pretty good uh, estimate of whether or not the values and variables in your simulation have steadied out. So this is just another monitor. All right. And then um, we can you know, go ahead and add some post-processing surfaces. We can also do that after the simulation is run. So I'll just go ahead and you know, initialize this. And then we are going to run the calculation for you know a few iterations. I'll just go ahead and do five because I already have the solution. So let me go ahead and load that. So once that starts running, um, you should be able to see the scaled residuals and also the moment plot and the epsilon plot that we set up. Uh, remember the uh, domain is stationary at the very beginning, and then we are subjecting it, subjecting it to 300 RPM all of a sudden. So 
uh, definitely you'll see that the magnitude of the moment and the epsilon quantities are quite high at the beginning. And then as the solution progresses, uh, you know, it's going to steady out a bit more. All right. So let me go ahead and close this guy and we'll open uh, the already solved problem. So let me go ahead and do that. So somebody is asked, um, will ANSYS import inventor models of tanks to leverage the CFD? Absolutely, ANSYS is CAD agnostic and most of the commercial CAD formats work very well with ANSYS, um, you know, whether you're importing it into Space Claim or Design Modeler or ANSYS Discovery, those are the three CAD prep models. Um, all of them have the ability to import um, inventor models. So yes. Um, the other question that I've received is, can you add heat transfer from coils within the tank also? Yes, you can. Uh, so ANSYS Fluent can definitely combine conjugate heat transfer with other physics, uh, whether it be multi-phase. And that is an actually important variable that you may want to look at, right? Temperature distribution in your overall mixed um, product. And so conjugate heat transfer will allow you to add heat sources in your domain uh, to any particular solid wall or volume. And that will then be convected and advected, diffused throughout the domain. Um, so conduction, convection, um, radiation, all those things are easily handled by ANSYS fluid. Okay, so I hope I answered that question. Uh, this is already a solved model. Let us very quickly go through some of the post-processing quantities that I was able to extract. Um, so first of all, you know, what I did was I created a mesh of all the rotating parts. And how I do that is I basically select um, all the rotating parts from the wall and then select faces. And if I go ahead and save and display this, then you see um, all the faces that were actually rotating. Um, why I have set this as a different mesh display name is because it's easier to combining it combine it with other post-processing results uh, when you're trying to visualize where exactly are you seeing higher velocity, lower velocity, pressure, et cetera, right? And so um, I've also created an ISO surface. Uh, ISO surface is basically any surface where you have a constant value of a particular variable. So let me actually quickly show you how to do that. Um, so you can go to results, you can go to create, you can click on ISO surface. Uh, say for example, I want to create uh, an ISO surface uh, where Y is zero. That means basically along the XZ plane, you could write ISO Y is equal to zero. I'll name it one uh, just because I already have a surface already. This is going to be a surface of constant mesh. And this is gonna be constant Y coordinate of zero, okay? Because the ISO value is zero. So what happens is I've basically created a face, a plane, which coincides with the XC plane, right? Because the Y is zero. And now any contour that I want to plot, any variables that I want to visualize, I can do that over here. So say, for example, I want to look at the velocity distribution on this plane. I can go to contours. I can hit new. I can name this velocity on y is equal to zero. We'll do contours of velocity magnitude. And then we'll select the surface. And we'll go ahead and do. Let me just go ahead and show you what I already have. The reason why it was not letting me do that is because I named it the same contour name. And so it doesn't create two objects with the same name, but this is the same thing. What I basically have is the velocity plotted on the plane, which coincides with XC. And here you can notice that 
uh, you have higher velocity contours uh, around the impeller, right? You can also superimpose this with the rotating parts that we saw earlier by creating a scene. So I can go ahead and create a new scene and then we can look at the velocity and the rotating parts all at the same time. And so that way you'll be able to see which relative location uh, am I looking at when I see these variables. The other thing that we usually do, right, is look at the shear rate uh, near the impellers. So let me go ahead and do shear rate. we'll do derivatives and we'll do strain rate. Strain rate is the same thing, right? So we'll go ahead and look at the values on this plane again. And you can see that it is a very nominal value, right? You're not getting a lot of um, shear on this particular plane itself, but the range is there, right? The range varies from zero to 2901. So perhaps on that particular plane, you're not experiencing a lot of shear, but there might be other reasons wherein you have higher shear. So how do you identify everywhere in the domain where the strain rate is quite high, right? So you can again create an isosurface. And this time we are going to choose derivatives from the dropdown menu instead of mesh. And we are going to hit compute that'll give you the maximum and minimum strain rate in your domain. So you can just basically select, say for example, 279, right? If this is the strain rate that you're looking at, it'll show you everywhere in your domain, you know, on a 3D basis where the strain rate is equal to this particular number. And so here, um, when you look at uh, the mesh, we just created another strain rate. So you can see that along the impellers where the shear force is the highest, that's where you're getting the maximum strain rate. And you can color this um, by a different color just for the sake of convenience. And then, you know, you can perhaps again, create a scene and combine different uh, contours. So say for example, let's do velocity. And so then this gives you a little bit more uh, insight into where you're looking at different quantities. I also have a vector plot over here just to show you how to detect the dead zones in your domain. So near the impeller, you have uh, you know higher velocities, uh, both the impellers top and bottom. But in between that region, you know, we don't see much activity over here. That means there isn't much mixing going around here. So you may see a lot of stagnation in this particular region. And this is the type of qualitative analysis that you can do by, you know, performing a simple CFD simulation. It'll help you determine, you know, what the flow characteristics look like. Okay. So this is just fluent. You can take this entire solved problem to a standalone post-processing tool like CFD Post or ANSYS Insight and do even more advanced uh, visualization and analysis. Um, and um, a lot of our customers also use it for marketing purposes, right? Uh, because they are in the process industry or they're in the service industry. Uh, and so it always helps to show uh, how CFD and simulation can be leveraged uh, to optimize your designs better. Okay. So that's all I had in terms of demo. Let me just go back to my presentation. And we'll just cover the summary slide uh, really quickly. Uh, hopefully the takeaway from today's presentation is that if you are uh, designing mixing tanks or if you are in the consulting business uh, with 
you know, several such projects. Um, we can definitely use ANSYS CFT simulation uh, to improve the process efficiency, uh, reduce testing, uh, reduce a lot of cost and time in that process, and then uh, perhaps build a design space, do a lot of what if analysis and rapid prototyping. Um, we also learned a little bit about the ANSYS Mixing Wizard, which is a ready-made template for you guys to easily set up your simulation, even if you're not a CFD expert. And then you can use that baseline simulation uh, to extract reduced order models, uh, which basically allow you to forego doing 3D simulations altogether, and then just using that single data space uh, to do qualitative quantitative analysis. Um, on various design parameters. Okay, so hopefully you guys found this useful. And if you have questions uh, about any particular step that I did in today's demo, or maybe you want to add more complexity to this type of simulation, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, we're happy to either discuss with you or send you some material uh, if it can be shared. Uh, let me just check the Q&A box really quickly if you guys have any questions. Uh, so somebody is asked, can ANSYS CFD simulate a mixing of dissimilar fluids? Um, other CFDs require density or viscosity, but we'd like to simulate a mixing chamber of an aeros aerosolized reagent and air. Yes, yes, um, you can definitely do that. Um, you know, there are a lot of simulations with immiscible fluids, right? Those have completely different properties, um, which is why they are immiscible. And uh, that is a common CFD application that we do with ANSYS Fluent. Uh, same goes for aerosolized flows, uh, gas liquid flows, uh, reacting flows. Um, no matter how different your properties, even if it is not Newtonian in nature, uh, you can definitely uh, simulate that using ANSYS Fluent. Um, and there are a lot of customization uh, techniques that allow you to, uh, you know, vary your properties uh, as the solution moves on. Uh, sometimes your properties will change with temperature, right? Uh, so all that can be easily uh, set up inside ANSYS Fluent. So I'm gonna wait a few more minutes if anybody else has any questions or comments, if you have suggestions or feedback for future KVA sessions or topics, feel free to share that with us as well. Okay, then I don't see any more questions. Um, hopefully, you know, I was able to tell you guys a little bit more about uh, the ease and capability of ANSYS CFD in doing such mixing tank, mixing equipment problems. Uh, hopefully you found it uh, useful. And if you have any questions, uh, again, feel free to reach out to us. With that said, I hope you guys have a good day ahead. Uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you.